Good evening, everyone. I would like to uh, thank everyone for attending this DeSoto online COVID-19 town hall meeting featuring our two distinguished guests, Dallas County Judge Clay Jenkins and Dallas County HHS Director Philip Wong. These two gentlemen have been guiding the efforts of every single city in Dallas County to combat the COVID-19 pandem pandemic. And let me tell you, neither one of them needs uh, an introduction, really. While we all operate under the orders of the governor, the judge and the doctor are responsible for guiding the fight against COVID-19 here. And this includes the operational, legal, and medical portions of a truly massive effort. We are grateful to them for their leadership during one of the toughest times in our history. Also with us tonight is our relatively new city manager, Brandon Wright. Good evening, Brandon. And Brandon joined us in the midst of uh, COVID-19, uh, this pandemic. He even volunteered to come on board uh, two and a half weeks early, and we are very thankful to him uh, for leading our team. I would also like to uh, offer special thanks to City Councilwoman Candace Paul for working with us to get the ball rolling on this effort and to thank our City Council uh, who is on the screen. I see most of them uh, and they're viewing this session tonight and we want to thank them for their support uh, when our city needs it. We all work together. We're in this together. Uh, DeSoto has been in the center of this battle, and we are thankful to our friends at the county for working with us to get through this. We experienced a large number of positive cases in the uh, uh, early weeks, uh, the early weeks of the pandemic. Uh, and though we have been making progress and have seen the growth of new cases slow considerably in recent weeks, you know, they've slowed considerably, but we still have a long road to travel. Our, res our residents have had many questions about why we have seen what we have seen. And we will get to those questions a bit later in order that, in the order in which they have been received. But for now, but for now, we want to welcome Judge Jenkins and Dr. Wong to our town hall, and we ask them to share their thoughts and advice with us as we all move forward. Judge Jenkins, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it very much, and thank you, everyone who's joining us tonight. Go Eagles! Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, you know, it's going to be very, very important that going forward. Uh, that we all make our very best decisions. And along those lines, local public health officials, not just at the county, but the chiefs of epidemiology and infectious disease at the big system hospitals, like Baylor in UT Southwestern, the CEOs of other hospitals, the president of the Dallas County Medical Society, the executive director of the DFW Hospital Council, have all come together to come up with recommendations for your family, not of what you can do, because the governor will determine uh, what you can do. And we saw today, uh, this last week, those things can change rapidly. Uh, he said, we won't get haircuts until the 18th. And then he got yelled at and said, we'll get haircuts on the 8th. And then he got yelled at some more and said, we'll get haircuts immediately. So what happens on the uh, orders can change. But what happens in public health is really what you and I want to focus on to keep our family safe. So you can go to DallasCountyCovid.org. You can download a, a guidance, a public health guidance during COVID for Dallas County residents. And that was done by doctors, not by politicians, uh, but by doctors. And so you can look at that thing. Your kid says, hey, Mom, I want to go play tackle football with my friends in the park. Um, you can look at that. And uh, based on where we are now, if you, if you follow the guidance, you can say, 
you know, you get to play tackle football, you can ride your bicycle, you can, um, you know, do all these other things, uh, but you can't play contact sports just yet. Your husband says, hey, when can I get a haircut? You look at the guidance and you're like, after a 14-day decline, you can get a haircut. Unless your husband's over 65 or has an underlying condition like diabetes, the guidance would say he needs to wait a little bit longer. And hey, 70s haircuts are the bomb, right? Um, and so we can look at anything we want to do, planning that family vacation for the summer, and you can see where the doctors would recommend that that is advisable for your family. Taking into account both what your family uh, looks like. Um, okay, for instance, your kid may be super healthy, right? But grandma lives with you. My mama uh, will be 88 years young on Thursday. And so we've got to think not only what is good for, for people under 65, but when my daughter and her friends bring that home, what's good for Nana? Okay. So we're looking at that, but all that's laid out in that little cheat sheet. You can download it to DallasCountyCovid.org, uh, and I encourage you to do that. Um, before I turn it over to Phil, I'll tell you where I think we are, and Phil would be, you know, may add to this. We've been at about 250 on new cases uh, every day for the last nine days. You know, what was it, 253 yesterday, 236 today, 251. Uh, the day before that. So kind of steadily going along. So what I hope this means, and this is what the medical models, by the way, said would happen. Let me turn this down. We got some TV going. It's kind of loud. There we go. Um, and uh, so what the medical model said is that we're done back in early April. We're going to hit our peak in late April or early May. We got to a high point the first week of May. And we just kind of floated for the second week uh, at the round 250. So if the medical models are right, that's what we call a plateau. You reach your peak and you plateau, right? Then after the plateau, you begin to go down some. And what we don't know about that is those medical models were done with the idea that we would stay sheltered in place until we had that CDC recommended 14-day decline. We didn't wait for that. The governor said he's anxious and ready to get started while we're still going up. So what effect that has um, on on this model is yet to be seen. Might make that plateau last a lot longer before it goes down. Or it might make that plateau just be a, a break from a step up to a new uh, high because more people get affected. So we'll have to see. We don't know yet uh, what's going to happen on that. But what the doctors will be looking at, if you download that deal to look whether we're red or orange, yellow or green, what the doctors are looking at is not so much how many tests we have and how many new cases we have, but they look at hospitalizations for COVID, which the hospitals all track, ICU admissions for COVID, and deaths. Okay? And, you know, people will talk about, well, we're getting more tests, we're getting less tests. Some reason why those numbers aren't, aren't legitimate or aren't good. Well, these other numbers, the governor agrees, everybody agrees. These are not numbers people can play with, right? You know, COVID death means you got a blood test, you were COVID positive, and of course you're dead. Um, the same thing with uh, hospitalization, ICU. You got a positive test for COVID and you are where you are. So they'll look at that. If it goes down for 14 days, we go down a color. and you go down a color, you get to do more stuff like, Healthy people eat in a restaurant, get a haircut. You go down another 14 days, people that are older or have an underlying health condition get a haircut and eat in a restaurant, and families go on vacation. What we're trying to get to is green, which is the new normal before you have a vaccine, right? That's basically as good as it gets until we have the vaccine. So, um, you know, that's, that's basically where we are. I'll take y'all's questions. Thank you, Mayor, for having us here. Oh, Mayor, you, you got your mute on. Thank you. You've done so many. We started at 7.30, 8.30 this morning. <laughs> so, yeah. um, 
Dr. Wong, is Dr. Wong with us? Bill, you there? I'll text him. Um, okay. I, it may be the public health committee that's meeting right now. Okay. Um, he's running along. I don't know. That would be good. Um, Madam Mayor, I do see Dr. Wong on the screen. Yeah, he is muted like I was. Yeah, man, you got to hit your mute, man. <laughs> hit the mute. I can't hear you. Thank still you. Can't hear you. Get, there you go. Talk. No, it's still muted. And Madam Please Mayor, uh, there are some people that could not, they're having trouble getting in it's online and on the phone. So it seems like we're at capacity, so yeah, just yeah. tell folks we're working on it. Thank you. All right. For those who are having trouble getting online by phone, they're working on it. Our IT. You're team. on mute again, man. Now you're off. Okay, I don't know. Dr. Wong? He's talking. I don't know what he's saying, but he's talking. Um, I'm wondering if our IT team needs to. Say, how, many, how many? I guess the public's already on this call, right? Yes, they are. Okay, well, forgive me for this. Bill, hang up and redial a number. See if that works. Hang up and call them back. All right. So, what I'd like uh, to do then, yeah. uh, until he comes on, is just move forward with the questions. We have questions from uh, citizens, so I will be reading those. And if there's something uh, you want to forward to him when he comes on, we can do that. But we yeah, want to take to, advantage. Try to read the ones that aren't for a doctor until he gets on here and gets the sound going. Okay. I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express, and I'm another doctor. <laughs> okay. The first question comes from uh, one of our local business uh, operators. She's an adult daycare operator, and she says that her business is an adult day center. We provide valuable activities and brain exercises for seniors with dementia that are living with their families. We have been closed since, since March 13, and many of our clients are declining rapidly without the daily activity. Of course, all of our clients are over 65 and have underlying conditions. Is there any guidance on reopening with 20 to 25 clients you can give her, and this comes from uh, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Mary Lynn Henry. Bill, you on? Yeah, can you can you hear me? Great, hit it, Bill. You, I can hear you, man. Did you okay, that? yeah, did, sorry, I was, the question? I was unmuted okay. and it wouldn't work last time, so no sorry. But did, did you right. hear the question about adult no. daycare? No? No, I did not. The question was about adult daycare. Ladies, you got adult daycare. When, they, when can they get open? What kind of help can they get? Adult daycare, we're talking about- Yes. Like, Older people, right? Yes. So, is there anything on that, Bill? Um, let's see. I, I don't have anything specifically on that one. Um, let's see. I mean, that's something probably maybe you need to investigate and get some. Yeah. So, a couple of things you can look at on there, and I don't know the answer to this, so Phil and I will look at it. Um, you can get a $3,000 forgivable loan, basically a grant for daycare. I think that's child care. I don't think it's adult daycare. Um, so that's one thing that you could look into. Um, and, well, her uh, question, uh, Judge Jenkins, deals with opening and just opening. advice okay. on that 20 to 25 clients. Right. So remember yeah. that we, um, so the governor will give you an answer as to opening, as to what is legal. The local doctors, um, who have uh, uh, prepared their entire adult life for this moment to give you an advice as to what is advisable health wise. And again, you can get that document at DallasCountyCovid.org. And so you can pull the document. You can, uh, there probably won't be a section for adult daycare, but there will be a section for gatherings um, of that size. And you can look to see. Where do we need to be on the down uh, slope, uh, on the decline of cases and, uh, going to hospital and die before you safely open that without having an outbreak? Uh, 
And so, and I don't know off the top of my head what that is. Uh, it's not red where we are now. I know that. Yeah, I mean, the orange guidelines for gatherings, for large gatherings, even when you get to orange, it's really fewer than 10, ideally. Well, and also, they're all over 65, so. Yeah, so that's. Yeah. Exactly. And throughout with that age group, the high risk group, uh, it's really recommended to try to stay home and not to be gathering in groups. Yeah. Okay, we're going to move then to the next question. Thank you for that. Um, how did the governor make a decision to open? Why didn't we wait 14 days? And, and then uh, there's also an additional question from this uh, person. Uh, it's from Francine Adger uh, is the name. And then why can't we all be tested? I'll take the first stab at that. So I had the opportunity to visit one-on-one -on -one with the governor several times, trying to convince him to follow the CDC and the local doctors. Um, you know, it, the information that I'm getting is no different than what basically every infectious disease chief and, and the epidemiology chief in America is telling people. And the same thing the governor's getting. I don't know why he chose not to follow that. I'll say this. Science is never the loudest voice, and it's never the strongest special interest. But the important thing for you and I is not what the governor says we can do, but what the local uh, health authorities tell us that we should do, right? So we can, if we want to, we can go hang out in a restaurant full of strangers tonight, drink a bunch of margaritas, and catch a midnight movie if there's any up open. But the doctors would tell us it's not wise to do that yet. And there's another component of that too, Mayor. Right now, we, as you know, and this is your second question, Mayor, um, we don't have enough testing to test everybody, right? So let's take a mall, for instance. Right now, if you go into a mall, you go to the town East Mall, it's probably going to be pretty empty, right? But as more and more people get in there, it'll be bigger crowds. But we don't have testing around that, so... The Dillards can't just test all their employees on Tuesday to find out if anybody's sick. And without that adequate testing, by the time you find out one of your coworkers is sick, there's a bunch of people sick, and there's a bunch of shoppers that got sick. So we need to wait until we've got that decline, um, like the doctors are telling us. We got to, uh, While we're getting that decline, hopefully we can get uh, more testing. Uh, because right now, it's a little... A little geeky information here, but um, right now in Dallas County, we have a positive test ratio of 13 to 15 percent. Every doctor that's looking at this in America, whether it be CDC, there was a Harvard study out a couple of days ago, says you want that number to be around 7 percent, right? The reason you want it to be low is what that tells you is you have enough tests so those stores are testing their employees most of whom should be negative, right? Because I'm healthy enough to go to work uh, at Dillard's. Hopefully I'm not sick, right? Well, who we're testing? We're testing people who go to Ellis Davis, sit in line. Why, why are they sitting there? Because they think they're sick, right? So we got a testing positive ratio in Dallas County twice as high as the state because we don't have enough testing. And unfortunately, even though we've been asking for a month, the state hasn't sent us any more tests. Now the feds are talking about taking some tests. So, um, you know, all that just says you and your family need to be really careful and to follow the advice of those doctors. Okay. Dr. Wong, since you're set, we uh, wanted to give you an opportunity to make some opening comments, if you'd like, and then we'll get back to the questions. Okay. Um, well, I know uh, the judge... Uh, talked a little bit about, you know, sort of where we are. We, uh, as you said, we sort of plateaued. Today we had 236 uh, new cases, total of 6,359. And then uh, three deaths today reported, so 148 deaths total. And we, we've sort of plateaued. And it's all dependent on, you know, how, um, I guess, these numbers start going as things have been opened up. We're worried about, you know, more Trans infection being spread, and 
we're just trying to monitor those numbers and see where it takes us in terms of the, you know, red, orange, yellow, and green. Um, you know, we've uh, specifically uh, looking at uh, some of the numbers in DeSoto, and there's been questions that came out about that. I think we've had a total of 134 uh, cases identified in DeSoto, and DeSoto has been sort of a hot spot. But one thing that's different about DeSoto compared to some of the other zip codes, you know, some zip codes we've had, like you might have the jail where there's like 200 cases there or, you know, there uh, or um, uh, a place that has one nursing home that's got a whole lot of cases. In DeSoto, there hasn't been like one place. It's been pretty spread around. And, and one of the things that we think, and, and it was brought up on one of our calls also, is that um, you all have done a great job really getting people to want to be tested and to go out and get testing. And then I know we've had the Ellis Davis Field House. It's not too far from uh, DeSoto. So it's been, I think, that's one of the reasons that we think the numbers in DeSoto are higher than some of the others, because there's been that testing site real close by. And you all, again, have done a great job really encouraging uh, people to go get testing. And, um, you know, again, following up on the question that the judge just answered um, in terms of, you know, why can't everyone get tested? We, we don't have still all the tests that we need. Uh, we still had to try, prioritize, but we've been gradually opening it up because we really wanted, uh, you know, frontline workers, grocery store workers, uh, people that work in other retail, uh, you know, retail workers to be able to get tested, whether they have symptoms or not. And now, you know, that's now open. So people can get that. So that's something that's that's um, you know happening, uh, and that we're uh, trying to uh, uh, to keep going. Uh, you know, because there are some information out there that I guess some of the federal support for the testing site you know goes away at the end. is scheduled to go away at the end of May, but we're really working hard with the city and uh, you know to try to keep that going because the testing is uh, so so important uh, uh, for. Uh, our ability to, to, you know, handle this uh, epidemic, uh, you know, as, as the judge mentioned also, you know, we're, we're hoping, you know, all of the shelter in place, all of that has been to really try to slow down uh, the spread and decrease the numbers so it's not as many people out there as he was talking about, you know, and the lower you can get that number, then when things up open up, then uh, we want to have the testing and everything available so we can identify uh, those, you know, people who are positive really quickly and then their contacts. And so really get all the contacts of that person tested and then, stop, you know, really uh, snuff out that cluster that comes up. And that's going to have to be our strategy, you know, once we get things low enough. And, and that's what we're still hoping to do. But that's why we're still monitoring where the numbers are, because we haven't seen that 14 day decrease, which really is what's recommended before we start moving to these other, you know, to orange and yellow and green. Um, and, and so that's what we're waiting for. But and, and that's what's you know, we're, it's a little concerning because things are opening up uh, before we've really gotten to where uh, we want to, you know, we would like it to be before that happens. Um, let's see. Dr. Wong, some, while you're yeah. talking about that, do you have any news for us in terms of uh, additional testing by private labs or uh, private entities that might come to it, to our community because we do need the testing and the contact tracing to continue oh, in absolutely. order to flatten the curve. If you will. Absolutely. No. And, uh, you know, where there are some other partners, I know uh, Walgreens uh, is doing some testing. Walmart, uh, we're working, uh, you know, the, uh, we're working with some of the state uh, partners uh, also on, you know, and Parkland Hospital to do testing in nursing homes and prioritizing that. And I know the governor just uh, mentioned something about trying to require all nursing homes to get uh, tested, but we've been doing that for a couple of weeks, really working with Parkland uh, to get those numbers and, and to really test the places where uh, some, you know, where we've had any residents or staff who tested positive, you know, we're trying to also work in some of these other, like, uh, you know, homeless shelter settings and other uh, congregate uh, settings. Uh, we're, um, but, you know, we're really also trying to get in parts of town that have some of the highest need, too, because that's where some of the highest burden uh, can, can occur, uh, whether it's because of, you know, just even underlying 
higher rates of some of the chronic conditions that put people at higher risk um, in addition to the uh, age uh, groups. You know, uh, I think one of the questions uh, that y'all have put for me to address, you know, we are to move from one category to the next. We're monitoring things like the hospitalizations, uh, the ICU uh, admissions, uh, the number of deaths, those things which aren't as dependent also on the number of tests that we do. And so we're monitoring those every day and, and we're looking for that, uh, you know, four, 14 day uh, decline in those numbers, uh, you know, to allow us to move uh, to that next uh, to that next level. Uh, but that is, you know, what we're doing. We've had a, a, a whole lot of uh, some of the experts from the hospitals, from the UT Southwestern, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, looking at the modeling for where we are and what we predict is going to happen. And, and as the judge mentioned, we're sort of right at that plateau and it's just sort of what had been predicted, but we're still waiting for that to go down. So, um, but pr getting te pr testing and maintaining the drive-through testings that we have down here and then, uh, you know, building more testing capacity is one of the top priorities, as well as you mentioned, uh, keeping up uh, the contact tracing, uh, the case uh, interviews, uh, those things that are going to be key to, to keeping this under control. Are we close to a time, Dr. Wong, when we can get the total number of individuals tested in 75115? That total number... You know, Oh, yeah. yeah, I know. It's been it's, it's been a hard number to get. Uh, you know, the um, we have from the city of Dallas, some of the reporting, we've tried to get it for the county. The governor's tried to get it uh, for the state. And there's some numbers out there. There's some numbers uh, uh, like that the governor reports by county. But I think NBC just did an investigative report. There's still holes in those numbers because there's a lot of doctors, a lot of labs that aren't reporting all these, even when we require them to report to us. Uh, they get lost. And it's a little concerning also as things move more even to these rapid tests and people just get these 15 minute tests and, you know, how many of those tests are going to get reported to us. So it's hard to get that denominator uh, number. But uh, as the judge mentioned, for the numbers that we have, it's been running about 13 to 15 percent of those that have been positive uh, or, you know, uh, so we have some limited numbers and that's what that's been showing. Okay. I will move to the next question. Thank you for your comments. Uh, this question is from a graduate student uh, in the Masters of Public Health program at UT Arlington. He says his classmate, uh, he and his classmate would like to assist in helping decrease the numbers of COVID-19 cases in Dallas County. How can we help out? For example, contact tracing or working at Dallas County Health and Human Services in some capacity. Moreover, who can we contact should you need help? Uh, um, I know that we are looking and, and, you know, the state is supporting it and we're trying to hire some temporary staff even uh, to help out with the contact tracing. Uh, you know, if, if you'll uh, send us the names or something, we can uh, put them in touch with our human resources that are going to be working on uh, getting those positions uh, filled. Again, some of them are part-time positions. Uh, to help out with that um, also uh, we've had a lot of volunteers too I think like even up to 180 I turned her volunteers from you know from UT Southwestern Medical School and other uh, you know nursing uh, support others that have been volunteering but we are hiring some additional staff and if you'll get the names maybe we can get them from you uh, we can let our human resources because uh, there are going to be some temporary uh, positions also coming up we're also you know we have community outreach workers that have been you know on the streets they've come to desoto they've come to uh you know all the different uh zip codes with some of the higher numbers uh trying to work with store owners make sure that they're implementing some of the best practices for how to uh practice the physical distancing making sure that posters educating people about uh the virus and you know how to prevent it are out there uh, for people who don't, you know, get their information from some of the other traditional sources. But we've been trying to be on the streets and then, uh, you know, to, to get that, uh, um, you know, information uh, to the community also. Um, so, so those are some other things that we're going to have some positions, maybe, I know, some temporary staff to help out with that uh, type of work, too. Well, uh, I just want to thank Mr. Burford Muntry for the question. And hopefully he's listening and 
heard your response. Uh, the next question is, is education being implemented throughout the community to dispel conspiracy theories? And we've been doing a lot of that, but I'll let comment on that. And then I'm going to go through all of these. Is more testing being done in DeSoto? I think that's being addressed. And the third part of Mr. Excuse me, of Brandy Briggs question is a symptom of COVID itching. Is itching a symptom of COVID? Uh, well, you want me to do that last one? I mean, you know, thus far, uh, CDC expanded the list of symptoms uh, related with COVID-19, uh, but itching was not one of them. Uh, you know, there was some uh, thing on, you know, loss of sense of smell and things, but that itching was not something that was added to the, uh, the symptoms. Um, Anything of, on conspiracy theories? Any comment on that? I, I don't know that we've specifically uh, been addressing conspiracy theories. Uh, we don't believe in conspiracy theories. Uh, I don't, you know, uh, but I don't know if the judge has been doing anything in particular with conspiracy theories. Um, no, you know, I would say this. I, I dealt with this. I dealt with this before with Ebola, um, when people wanted to make it uh, Liberian Ebola. Now we want to make it Chinese coronavirus. Uh, all these things are trying to marginalize and blame some section of the community uh, for a disease that does nothing uh, to help us fight the disease. It does nothing to bring us together. But we're all in this together. The decisions that I made uh, to go out to a restaurant affect all of you. Decisions that you make, whether or not to wear your mask at the grocery store, affect me. And so um, we need to show a lot of grace towards each other. And uh, a lot of these uh, you know, basically racist statements that some people are making are not helpful. There's also statements about this is no worse, worse than the flu. Well... I don't know. I, I hadn't spent a lot of time trying to, to refute that. But um, when's the last time they shut down uh, basketball season and we all had to stay home for the flu, right? But when's the last time the flu uh, became the third leading cause of death in Dallas County in a month? So, you know, I think um, you're going to get people with different opinions on things. Um my opinion is that I really am not qualified to have an opinion. Uh, my job is to listen to the doctors uh, who have prepared their adult lives to advise us and then act decisively uh, to keep people safe. I think that's, for those of us in the government, that's what we're called to do. You know, in our normal roles outside of a uh, once in a hundred year pandemic like this, and we can cuss and discuss how we spend our budgets or whether we should hire so-and-so or hire somebody else. But when it comes to these pandemics, we got to listen to these scientists to have the best chance to keep people safe. Thank you. And uh, Mrs. Evelyn, Ms. Evelyn DeWitt uh, submitted a comment, basically. She's a senior that's 71 years old and feels uh, that there are places where she goes and she's being harassed for always wearing her mask. And I'm just going to say... It's basically a comment, but I think you've addressed that, how important it is, Dr. Wong, to continue wearing the mask when you're out in public. And especially for those of us who are in that high-risk age category, correct? Yeah, um, you know, and the fake cost facial coverings, these masks, they really are important for everyone to wear um, because it's not necessarily uh, to protect the wearer as much also as, you know, because there's a, there, we uh, became more aware that people who don't have symptoms even can spread this. So if everyone's wearing it, then uh, people who might not have symptoms but might have infection, then it prevents them from spreading droplets and things. Because the one thing to know about the mask, though, and the cloth facial coverings, it does not mean that you don't still have to practice the six foot uh, physical distancing that you still don't practice you know you still it's really important to wash your hands don't touch your eyes nose and mouth and things but wearing the cloth facial covering is really important uh, uh for everyone to do when they're like out in public and in those uh settings where you know you can't 
uh, keep six feet away because this asymptomatic spread where people don't have symptoms and they could just be talking and their droplets could, you know, just come out and uh, um, get cause more infection. And so if everyone's wearing it, then it keeps those people uh, from spreading the, the droplets. Thank you. Uh, can I just say this, Evelyn, thank you for wearing your mask. What you're doing is you're helping keep your community safe, keep other people at the grocery store safe, right? So when we think about these masks, don't think of it as an infringement on our personal liberties. Think of it as an act of solidarity uh, to help our community, right? Because a core human value and an American value is kindness and concern for the community. And when you wear that mask, and you protect others in the store and the clerks in the store. Think about those grocery store workers or Kroger's who are risking so much so you can get your, your essentials, right? So when you honor them by wearing your mask, that's an act of solidarity and kindness um, in the community, which is quintessentially American. So I thank you, Evelyn, for doing that. Thank you. Um, Lolita, the, I don't have a last name, but Lolita B. and Malbrook Farms, you wrote, why does DeSoto have such a high number of cases? And you've addressed that, you and Dr. Wong, to some degree. But uh, could you also comment on the fact that there are no borders? And DeSoto is a very mobile community with professionals living here. Could you add to that? Right. Uh, well, that, I mean, that's a great point. And I know uh, the judge talks about it, you know, when some of the different counties, neighboring counties, uh, don't uh, implement some of the same, you know, recommendations that we do. It affects all of us uh, because, you know, they might go over to some neighboring community and go party or go to some bar or whatever that's open, but then they come back home into our communities. And, and you know, there is a lot of uh, crossover. And so that's why it's so important for everyone to be practicing this and, um, uh, yeah, I, I think exactly what you're saying. There's no, they don't know any borders. Okay. Um, I can't tell the name on this, but it is, uh, there's an email address. So I'm just going to ask the question. Um, how are we going to deal with these crowded outdoor parties? The question that put all at risk. What is your recommendation on this? dealing with that. We, we're already doing as much as we can through our uh, police department and their community engagement, our fire department, and all of us who are leaders in the community through our city manager and his team. Just what can we do to discourage those? You know, it's tough, and it's going to get tougher, Mayor, because I received a letter from the Attorney General uh, a couple of hours ago and that letter said basically all of those recommendations that the governor had, like don't have those parties, those are recommendations, but I don't actually want you to follow those. And if when the county said, hey, go ahead and follow those in a place where we have to announce numerous deaths every day, go ahead and follow those. They've said, no, you can't make people follow them. That's just recommendations that we don't want to put in your teeth back. So it gets harder. But, you know, I would say this, right? We know this as leaders. The best way to lead people, you know, you can lead people to do something by yelling at them and uh, mistreating them and making them uncomfortable. And you can get them to do that thing maybe one or two times. But if you want people uh, to follow, they have to be treated with respect, right? They have to understand why it's important. So I think it really isn't coming on us in the face of a wilting state policy where they are going to continue to diverge from science um, and be afraid to enforce their own orders. It's incumbent on us, and they're not going to let us enforce their orders for them. So it's incumbent on us to talk to people about the importance of that and get them to follow us out of mutual respect and out of an understanding for public health um, because uh, we're going to increasingly find ourselves without the ability uh, to enforce that. And that makes it really challenging, you know. It's like uh, dealing with Governor Abbott and what's happening in the state uh, is a lot like those video games we played as kids where every time you get through a level, they just throw more more uh, bad guys at you 
more more challenges at you. So today got more challenging because he's like, hey, don't enforce my recommendations. And last week he was like, hey, the people defy my orders, don't you have a judge hold them accountable for that? And now it's don't enforce anything. And so, you know, it makes it challenging, but the important, it doesn't matter, right? Because our job is to keep people safe. We've got to figure out some way to get people to make their best choices and stay safe um, and follow those public health uh, doctors so increasingly without any uh, tools to do it. And that leads me to one, and it's really, uh, uh, I guess, really uh, a serious concern right now with graduations. Uh, coming up, and some have already happened. Are there any concerns from your perspective uh, about families getting together to celebrate graduations? And again, you know, just to comment about the number of cars that's gathering, but as people in those cars, what's your what's your concern? You mentioned earlier today in our meeting that DeSoto had reached out to the county to ask for help. Right. You comment on that. Sure. I'll just real briefly, because I'll turn over to Phil. He's the public health expert. I'll tell you, you know, my heart goes out to these kids who have worked so hard, and their graduation is different, you know, than the big sister, what have you. Um, but that doesn't need to mean it needs to be less special, right? So we've got to find ingenious ways that are safe. You got to listen to these public health doctors about what's safe, and then find ways, um, you know, to make it meaningful to the kids you know my kid didn't have a birthday during this time but i've heard of the drive-by birthday parties you know the different things i don't know what we get for these kids but we need to think of what would be meaningful and let them know how valuable how special they are to our community at the same time we got to keep them safe because i think phil's concern is in the best circumstances you get 700 kids who are seeing each other potentially for the last time together they're not going to maintain six-foot distancing. So, Phil, you want to talk about that? Yeah. Uh, you know, it is very heartbreaking. Um, I actually have a daughter who's supposed to be graduating now from graduate school, and, and her ceremonies are canceled, too, and it is very – they've worked so hard. But, you know, we are still – you know, the numbers are still – we're in that red zone still. And um, it just – you know, the public health, we uh, reviewed it with the public health committee and the experts and, and still, you know, did no, we did not feel comfortable, uh, you know, relaxing it for that. I mean, it just is still consistent with the guidance uh, that we're making, you know, for while we're in red, there should not be those big, uh, large gatherings. Uh, but, you know, there are a lot of innovative ways that they're trying to honor graduates virtually and, and so to try to. Uh, make things uh, special and memorable in that way. Uh, but it just, you know, you don't want the memory to be people getting sick and and uh, getting COVID. Um, so unfortunately, uh, that's been our recommendation. Okay. Um, let's see. This question, I think you've addressed this to some degree, uh, but... It, it's what actions will be taken in the event that Dallas County continues to see a rise in cases. Will these actions be decided by the governor? Or can Dallas County leadership decide what's best for Dallas County? So the governor in his one of his orders said he and he alone will decide if we need to back off of some of his orders. So that's part of the answer. Now, remember what we talked about earlier with that document from the from the doctors. You can get it at DallasCountyCovid.org. Um, what the doctors are talking about, we're red right now. 14 to decline, we get to orange. Um, the, the next step would be to get to yellow. But if we get down to orange and the governor's opening causes a big increase in positive cases and his in- unwillingness to enforce his own orders and recommendations. So it starts going up. And unfortunately, you're not down in yellow, you're back up in red. And so the governor is not going, apparently, not going to tell us, not going to uh, enforce his order, not going to find anybody, not going to uh, 
may take an action against a business that misbehaves um, or puts you at risk. Um, although, you know, you never know because last week he was saying he would, uh, you could still bring an action against a bar, for instance, that if once a restaurant that has over 25% of the people in there, he may have changed his mind about that. But the latest thing he said, uh, probably 72 hours ago, is that, that was still an enforcement that it, you could lose your license. So, um, but it's going to be up to us to make those good decisions. And so what I suggest we all do, and what we push out to our constituents is, hey, here's a document from doctors, right? Here's the answer. The bar's open, you know, the bar's not open yet, but it probably won't be long before the governor opens the bar. But, so the, the bar of the restaurant is open. Should you go or not, uh, look at this document, right? Because at some point it'll be okay for the doctors will say it's 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 fine for Candace to go, um, but, you know, if she, her grandmother may need to wait a little while longer, right, to go to the restaurant. Or if she's got a diabetic cousin, he may need to wait a little while longer to go to the restaurant. So, so they can look at that cheat sheet and they can kind of see what's best for the family. One other thing to remind you on that, so, we, you know, using the example of Candace, if if Candace is planning on going to visit grandma or the diabetic cousin, right? She might not want to go to the restaurant, right? Because what they're saying is in those guidelines, they say, if you're, you know, do, it's okay to do these things now. If you're uh, under 65 and don't have an underlying health condition. But when you look up at the top of the document, it says you got to consider who you're going to visit too. So it's like the mere fact that Candace has a grandma. Um, or a diabetic cousin doesn't mean she can't uh, do the thing. But if she's planning on, if she's the one taking the food to grandma, then she needs to treat it as if she is grandma. Uh, because, you know, she don't want to take that exposure over to Nana's house, right? So that's a really important document that we all got to push out there. That gives our community the best chance to not have a big spread, right? And it's completely volunteer. So make it look at that and say, I don't care. As soon as the bar is open, I'm going to be sitting on the stool, uh, you know, knocking back beers. And that's their call, right? And hopefully what most people will do, and I think what most matriarchs will do in a house is say, I'm not interested in what a politician tells me my family can do. I'm interested in looking at what the doctors tell me my family should do. And so hopefully mama will, will uh, you know, stop people from doing things that are dangerous kind of with the way the governor is, it's kind of increasingly important on those those matriarchs and those uh, family leaders to make those good choices. Okay, I want to thank uh, Ms. Luana, Luana Walker for that question. And some of um, Ms. Reniqua Gilliam's questions fall, or excuse me, fell into that same category, but she also asked the question, and this is Ms. Gilliam, um, does DeSoto have an assigned epidemiologist due to the high number of cases in this area, Dr. Wong? Um, you know, we have a, a team of, you know, great epidemiologists doing a lot of work on this, the uh, case interviews, contact tracing, all that. There's not, a, they're not a single one assigned just uh, to DeSoto. I think, you know, they're working on different uh, areas throughout the county, uh, but they're sure uh, making sure that you know all the uh, needs and issues are addressed uh, for DeSoto. But there's probably a whole team that's working on that. Okay, she also uh, is interested in knowing what has the county and the city been doing uh, to encourage businesses in DeSoto to require masks and operate uh, at a reduced capacity. I'm going to ask the other questions. Um, are DeSoto-based businesses provided any PPE for their employees and our reimbursement stipend? If you could address at least the part that, uh, for the county. Sure. So we require, um, you know, this is one of the things the governor doesn't like, right, is, is they're saying you can't require patrons to wear a mask. So the people that are going to the store 
uh, or cannot be required to wear masks. It wasn't real clear that we couldn't require the people working in the stores to wear the mask. And so as far as I'm concerned, they're still required to do that. Uh, as far as PPE, I may, I may remind me, Mayor McGowan, if I missed a piece of the question. Okay. But as far as PPE reimbursement to the uh, or provision to the businesses, uh, this is something I talked to the CARES Act Committee of County Employees about uh, today. And, uh, you know, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about how to get the city's money and how to get businesses PPE today. There's nothing to announce on that yet. So far, the county's programs that are out there are grants for child care, rental assistance, and uh, uh, small business assistance. Uh, for sure, the next tranche or next section of things is be more money for rental assistance, more money for businesses. I don't know about more money for child care. We have to see how much of that they actually use. Um, one of the things that I'm putting, two things I'm pushing for are PPE for small business. Um, I have three things, actually. PPE for small business, direct reimbursement to cities. Now, I'm saying the governor owes you some money. Um, that's the first thing I'm doing. I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, and then the, uh, let's see, reimbursement PPE, and then broadband. We're trying to do something uh, where we, when we think about this new economy and this kind of new normal, You've got people that they work in sales, reception, some sort of a, of a job that requires them to answer the phone and, and take down information on the computer. In order for them to keep that job in a time when we may be back at home in the fall when this thing kicks back up, they need good broadband. So we're trying to work on using some CARES Act money to increase broadband uh, for people, particularly for families where the breadwinner is making them 20 bucks an hour. Um, so those are some things we're looking at. PP is one of those things. Can I, can I talk to you real fast? Did I cover her, her question? Yes. So, yes. Let me talk to you real fast about the governor's uh, uh, plan for cities and large counties and why that is, needs to be pushed back on. So I had a call today with all the county judges in the 12 counties that got money. And we are working on a joint letter, Republicans and Democrats, to the governor. Because I want you to kind of watch what's happening. The governor's saying every city should get 55 bucks a piece per person. And in Wachtahatchee, I'll pay that out of the state's $8 billion. But in DeSoto, we want you, County, to pay that out of the money that you got. Well, it's not about Dallas County or DeSoto, right? It's about the, our shared constituents <laughs> in DeSoto, right? So... If the governor pays what's a $55 per person, but he says to to, uh, to Dallas County, you pay DeSoto $55 a person, where's that money going? It's going to our constituents, right? So basically it shortchanges every man, woman, and child in DeSoto $55 because if he would pay them what he's paying what's a and everywhere else, um, they'd have that 55 and they'd have the full amount of the money that's come to the county is going towards that way. So um, what we're all writing, the governor is saying, look, if you just release one more percent of this money, you know, he's keeping most of the money that should be going to, to people for rental assistance, to help with the business. But he's keeping most of it for whatever he hadn't said what it is. But if he, he will release one more percent, the result, I don't know about just DeSoto. Let's see, DeSoto's got, you know, 50,000 ish people. 55 bucks a piece, somebody can pull it up on the phone and ask. But outside the city of Dallas, we have 1.3 million people. That's $71,500,000 that the governor's trying to shortchange our residents out of. And so we all need to work together to write the governor to say, hey, governor, we don't want to take our money to pay ourselves. We want the portion of the money, like you're sending Waxahachie and everywhere else in the state. We want that kind of a deal for DeSoto, Coppell, whatever. Give us our money, too. Don't don't say take some of our county money and treat that like that's our city money because Ellis County is getting county money and city money, that's right? So, you know, I'll get you a copy of, of – I'm sending this. I think Shay sent in a letter while I was sitting on this deal uh, for 
with me personally. And I'll get you a, a and that was probably not all that nice. And then I'll get you the nicer one from all both me and all the other county judges in the morning. So you all can Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Uh, Denise Valentine had a, <clears throat> excuse me, a series of questions, some of which have been addressed. So I know we're running out of time, so I want to get to the one that hasn't. And sh she wants to know why did DeSoto have such a high rate of infection for the initial, during the initial six weeks? But facts, not theories, have been confirmed. And she just said she's glad it's gone, it's gone down, but only facts can prevent the resurgence. Any comments on that? I'll give it to Phil, but I would guess that it's because, you know, it's probably, a, who knows, right? But it's, it probably deals with the fact that the Soto leaders like yourselves did a good job telling people to get tested, that you've got ample testing at Ellis Davis, which is, you know, right across uh, 20, right, on both. Uh, so you got plenty of testing there. Uh, also, DeSoto, compared to some other uh, places, have has a higher degree of, of insured people. Insured people have access to testing through their doctors. So you add all those things together. If, and I'm not saying this is the case if we don't have enough testing to know. But if DeSoto has the exact same amount of infection as South Dallas, the uh, proximity, the a number of people who have cars, uh, the amount of people who have insurance, and the fact that their leaders are pushing them to get testing means you're going to have more show up in DeSoto than you're going to have in a neighborhood that doesn't have access to reliable transportation, doesn't have insurance, doesn't have leaders pushing them. So that's one thing. Now, there may have been some outbreak. I don't know. But, Phil, what do you think? Yeah, no, uh, exactly. That's certainly um, what we're thinking uh, because there wasn't any, uh, like, concentrated num di distribution of cases in one place. It was really scattered around, and, and we do think you all got a good, did a good job uh, getting people to take advantage of the testing there and really encourage people to do that. Uh, so, um, you know, but, uh, then, and it is, you know, it's, it's so easily spread it's around. So, um, but again, I think you all got, uh, did a good job getting people tested. There's a lot of, I don't know if you see this current mayor, but there's a ton of like racist stuff popping up on top of y'all's green um, or at least it's popping up on mine. Yeah, Madam Mayor, there is some stuff coming across us that's very yeah. derogatory. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know. There's, some, there's something, or there's someone that's tapped in. We're going to keep moving. Thank you. Uh, we, we're ignoring that. Uh, Judge, I know we're getting close to where we'd like you and Dr. Wong to give, your, uh, give some closing comments, but sure. This is something uh, that's been noticed a lot um, lately and that young people are also contracting something that they may feel uh, is connected to coronavirus. And I would not want to conclude this without asking you to comment on that. Sure, Phil, you're the doctor, you wanna answer that one? Uh, yeah, uh, no, uh, can you say that again? What was that? Uh, yes, uh, young people, you know, children, uh -huh. children are contracting some disease, and, and it may be coronavirus or whatever, but they're, they're not really sure uh, what's going on there. Could you just come in? Because some of our children think that they may not, be, you know, contract coronavirus. So if you could come in. Yeah, um, I mean, we've definitely seen, you know, even though it's less common, the serious illness in young uh, people, young children, uh, it's it's definitely, uh, you know, I think New York has had some uh, complications uh, seen in children that we, we haven't necessarily seen here, but we're going to start looking into that. And then, um, you know, we've had a death in a 17-year-old girl 
uh, in our community. And um, uh, we've had, you know, definitely, I think, um, what is it? Maybe 30, uh, you know, a little over a third, I believe, of the deaths have been in, you know, uh, persons from long-term care. But then uh, I think then another two thirds have been, you know, not in long-term care. Uh, and um, uh, so, you know, it's really not just uh, older population. It, it, I think, again, like the death in the 17 year old is a striking example of how this can really affect anyone. Okay. Well, at this time, I want to thank you so much on behalf of all of my colleagues on the city council and the city, citizens of our community for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, Dr. Wong, Judge Jenkins, we know your days are long. Uh, you're doing this pretty much 24 seven, but we would like to conclude with some closing comments from you, uh, Dr. Wong, and then the, the judge. Okay. Yeah, no, uh, and thank you, uh, Mayor, for inviting me and for uh, the opportunity. We really, it's, it's been, you've been a partner with us on multiple issues and the HIV issue and others uh, and a leader on those uh, and you know this is unprecedented sort of public health situation that we're dealing with uh, and we uh, you know I think the community your community uh, has really pulled together we've all rallied and, and uh, you know implemented the uh, stay home stay safe and it's made a difference we really did you know quote flatten the curve and uh, have um, you know, made a significant um, impact on decreasing the number of deaths, I think, uh, and the number of hospitalizations and the burden on our uh, health care system. And that's, you know, I mean, and people shouldn't, I mean, should be proud of what we've done with that, but we have to keep vigilant. Uh, you know, we're monitoring all the data and watching, you know, uh, to see when it's going to be ready to open things up but we're not there yet. But I think if everyone can stay still practicing all the things, uh, we'll get through this together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Judge Jenkins. You know, Mayor, I would just say um, I'm, I'm proud of the work that the Soto has done. Um, and uh, we're all in this together. And it's increasingly important that each and every person, so all 50,000 of the people in um, so the, particularly the heads of household and mostly I know the man thinks they're the head of the household but mostly right now I'm talking to the mom is right download that doctor recommendation and then look and see what it says and then tell your husband or your significant other and your kids that's what they're doing okay that is the best way to keep this thing from spreading and then I think for those of us who own businesses uh, to those who much is given, much is expected. So these are not guidances for business. But look, you know, if if, if your business is, uh, requires a large crowd of people to come together, and you can look at that guidance and see crowds shouldn't be coming together right now, there's your answer, right? Um, so that document can, uh, that the doctors have thoughtfully prepared uh, can really uh, help us. And... Uh, you know, I think it's very important that we show grace uh, to one another and to ourselves, especially I'm talking to people's faces, as I can see on this call. This is a very long deployment, right? And we're making a lot of decisions. And those are life and death decisions that we have to make every day. And, uh, there's no perfect person, you know, on this earth. And so some of the decisions will be things that we're very proud of. Some of the decisions will be things that people will tell us months later we should have done differently. So we got to have grace with ourselves, and no matter who you are, and it's stressful on everybody, right? If you're wondering about your rent, you're wondering about your job, uh, if you're out there listening to this. Um, so what I would say is unplug from that TV, do something meaningful, spend time with family, get some sleep. Um, you know, we all have to, I'm talking to elected leaders, but I'm just also talking to you citizens out there, residents. Uh, we got to stay in this fight. And the way we stay in the fight is to take care of ourselves. So uh, unplug and practice self-care and take care of yourself. Thank you. Me. Thank you so much. And please know that we're ignoring some of the comments on the screen. We are more determined to uh, serve and fight on behalf of our citizens. 
and nothing anybody says or nothing they do will stop us from uh, continuing to work hard on behalf of DeSoto, on behalf of our region, our nation, and really trying to uh, make sure that we all do our part because the entire world has been impacted by this. And so uh, just thank you again, you, uh, Judge Jenkins and Dr. Wong for being our special guest tonight. And I wanna thank my colleagues again and our uh, city manager for serving as panelists uh, for this evening. God bless you all. God bless. Good night. God bless. Good night.